Hello and welcome to Season 4 of the Sunday Podcast, presented by SportsShoes.com. I'm Ollie Lum. And I'm Matt Seddon. This podcast is all about elite distance running in the UK. We're here to give you all the latest news updates around the sport. As well as weekly interviews with athletes and coaches. Stay up to date by following us on Instagram and X at Sunday Podcast. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel too, where we post athlete workout videos, shoe reviews and more. Thanks for listening. And as always, we hope you enjoy the episode. Okay, hello and welcome back to another episode. As you can see from the title, obviously, Chris Jones, our guest for this week, and we'll get into that episode later on. Obviously, though, we've got to cover it. Um, the Boston 5K, and then obviously there was a 3K as well indoors. We've been talking about it for a few weeks. Um, let's put it this way, Matt. If you're a fan of fast times indoors in January, it didn't disappoint, um, but I'm sure we'll get into a bit of that in a bit. Oh, boy. I mean... Man, I woke up, I was just telling you, I woke up a quarter to six for some weird reason. I'm not even a morning person. I think my body had like, you know, spidey senses that something big went down. Obviously, first thing I do, load up the laptop, watch the races back, check the times. Um, and, and mate, I'm, I'm blown away. I mean, for the Brits, fantastic. Look, Millsy, Aiken ran within 0.5 of a second with each other, of each other, um, in different races, which is just absurd. Two Brits smash the Olympic time. Surely Mills is it is 5K. I've been saying for a little while on, on this podcast, if I'm Mills, I, you go for the 5K yeah, for Paris. Um, and then Jack Rowe wins the 3K in 7.38 and, and closes in. One thing that was missing from Jack's game, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying for a few years, was was that close. Takes down a 331, 332 guy, and, and now he, um, over the last 200, he runs his 359 mile last week at altitude, 4,500 feet in New Mexico there. He's clearly worked on his speed, and I think that's been the difference this year. Um, so 738, he's going to run Boston again in two weeks, um, that one in Feb. If he can snatch a time, we got three people. I think we could be looking at our Olympic team right there, to be honest with you. Um, maybe we're being naive. Maybe we're just being a bit premature. But Lum, when we look at the races and for some reason in the summer, you know, elite 5,000 racing, because you factor in all the Ethiopians that go race and Kenyans and East Africans that go race on the Diamond League circuit, near impossible to get into those races. Um However, someone like Mills and Aitken, they're going to be able to get into those races now. But, you know, Rowan, as his PB stand, he's he's probably very unlikely going to get into one of those high-class diamond leagues. Um, I mean, until he goes and runs 13.02 in Boston in a few weeks, maybe. But I think we could, be, but all I'm saying is that, you know, the race is getting a lot harder to get into come the summer because I think you just factor in loads of, you know, faster people. Um, so... But yeah, just it's yeah. it's bonkers. It's bonkers. I mean, what did you make of of having those two separate races? We could have had, you know, five, six guys all go thirteen in the same race, battling it out. But I think they actually run quicker in two separate races. Less bodies yeah, I think at, run, at the front I think, end. I think they've definitely run quicker as a result of it. But for me, I, th I think it's the biggest problem with our sport that we're still valuing these times over seeing who's actually the best guy. Like we've ended up with these two sets of results, which are brilliant. Like what have we got? Uh, five guys sub-13 between them, two Brits in there. Do we know who's the best? No, we have no idea. And and that's what grates me is that, yeah, fine. Like I, I get it. Like, And I think it does come from... Not Boston, like the guys putting on the meat themselves. I think it comes from what you've mentioned there. There's not other opportunities, so people have to snatch it now. So we give them the best opportunity to run quick they can because they might not get another one um, for Paris, which sounds crazy, um, seeing as we're only in January. Um, so in that sense, for the athletes, for what they need, it's a good thing. For the sport, I think it's terrible, personally. Uh, I, ju I just think, like, how, do you, how are you attracting attracting fans like creating excitement when people aren't actually racing each other but for the athletes themselves these athletes individually i think it's the best thing for them at the time because it means they had an opportunity to run super fast and some of them have, have ticked that take that qualifying standard off like you say like george mills you, if that's one race he's probably in the b section anyway so and then he doesn't get that opportunity yeah if you went purely on pbs 
probably right. I mean, for me, I, I know what you're saying, um, and I am a you know believer in in racing and and races as well. Um, but I want to see these head to heads, but I feel like in January it's just not that deep. Um, and you know you're you're never gonna have a, a big head to head duel in January because everyone knows the result doesn't matter anyway. These guys race against each other and they come sixth, seventh, eighth. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Like it, it, it's irrelevant. I mean, that's that's my point. Right. So, that's my point, though, is that we, we're always saying that the reason our sport doesn't grow is because the athletes don't head to head each other enough. Yet we had an opportunity where we had, what, 25 guys who wanted to come and run a quick 5K in January, making sure they were in shape for this race. Huh. And then we yeah. avoided that head to head. But time, time and a place. I don't think January is the time for head to heads. Maybe on the cross country, maybe on the roads. That's a good time for head to heads. But January on the track, <sighs> indoors, I, I'm happy to see. I'm I'm fine with seeing these fast times. I think it's an opportunity. It's almost like a, it, it, you know, put it into football terms. It's a preseason. You know, it, it's it, it's preseason for these athletes. Obviously, they're running electric times, so you know they're in the shape of their lives. But it's preseason. I think what it does do, you know, Boston. I think. Time and time again now, it is, you know, even even the last three years um, at Boston, maybe longer, um, you know, even four years, four or five years dating back pre-COVID. It is the place. If you're looking to nab a 5K, 5K standard, 3K standard, something along those lines, it is the place to go. And and these athletes has been preparing since track season ended for this race. Um and and it's paid off. And one thing I wanted to mention, Lum, you know, moving away from from the racing a little bit is obviously, you know, OAC, huge representation. Um, Millsy comes out on top, beats his American uh, teammates or American, you know, the on group in America. But uh, but on do a fantastic job. And this is where we have got to shout them out a little bit at celebrating their athletes. I honestly think that looking at that company, everyone who works for that company know exactly who George Mills is, Ben Flanagan, Georgie Beamish, Morgan, like they they will actually know these runners and know their story and know about them. And they're all set like on employees, on the brand, celebrate these performances. And I'm not sure how many brands actually do that. You look at Nike, Adidas, do they celebrate their athletes' performances? And look, unless they're like Noah Lyles, you know, winning 100. They yeah. don't, they don't. And I bet the employees barely know what athletes they're kind of working for i would i would say that they have the the kind of the the benefit of being a pure running brand in that sense though like if you're a if you're an adidas employee for example they do. it's cool like yeah you 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 can go and be a, a messy fan instead and then who's going to kind of pick pick a track athlete over that so um but but i think you're right they, they are they are doing something slightly different um for the sport um it's good we had an interesting comment on our post uh asking us if we're gonna finally start noticing george mills um i believe back uh back in uh early days of the podcast we had george george on the pod yeah, um, very early on for us uh so yeah i think I, I think it's it's interesting and it shows the caliber of british athletes that george mills is someone we haven't spoken about massively in the past few years but when we've had when he was in the 1500 scene um uh, and you kind of you've got your curves you've got your whiteman's getting those medals it just shows you the depth we've had um, but it's brilliant to see he's kind of look that we've said for a while that 5k spot is open uh for someone to come and be number one him and Aiken battling out now you've mentioned Roe um I think on Roe's win as well you mentioned kind of improving his speed that's almost how we saw him kind of get into the I guess sub elite elite kind of sphere when he beat Bucci in that um in that indoor meet mm -hmm. um and since then probably since he's almost become pro because that was almost like him kind of battling with the pros battling against Bouchard um he's probably not won a race on the track or not kind of a high key race like this so brilliant to see from him he's kind of backing up his road wins um, with some shorter stuff too mm. I'm interested to see obviously he's going to compete in Boston I'm interested to see if he's committed to uh if he wants to go to World Indoors that standard by the way 734 they're only letting 15 men go to World Indoors and it's going to be a straight final. Um, so I haven't checked the rankings to see where he is. Obviously, it's early days in the indoor, se indoor season. Um, and it'll be again, it'll be off points. So unfortunately, you know, Roe might not be in a position which will, which will give him the points. But 
that 3K will go towards his 5K ranking when you're looking at Olympic spots. Um, and the same with Mills and Aiken. Obviously, it doesn't matter because they got the standard, but that 3K on points will go towards his standard. Um, just not sure. Would need to double check the the rating of that Boston meet because um, I don't think it's. Uh, I think it's equivalent to a to a maybe a bronze tour, um, which is a C race um, on on the list. So um, it might be equivalent to that. So not not particularly, you know, high points um, for the race just because of its label, um, according to World Athletics. But but anyway, that's getting a bit technical. Um, but Lumshree, you know, we we got to mention as well. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but this Nico Young workout. Um, obviously, uh, you know, he runs twelve fifty seven as well. Gets beat by Adrian Wildshoot. That workout was sickening. Starts it off, does a four hundred to give a bit of context. People haven't seen it. Four hundred and fifty three to get things going, has like an eight minute rest, does a 2K in 5.17. Then he rips four fours in like 58. And then he finishes up as like a 155, 800. And he does all of this at 7,000 feet altitude is disgusting. But Mike Smith's there, his coach going, only Nico can do this. You know, he's he's built different. You know, gas him up a little bit. So he should, being his coach. And he probably is watching something that he probably hasn't seen before. Um but I just I just chuckled because Adrian Wildshoot goes and outkicks him and like just looks the same. So I'm like, I think Wildshoot could have done that workout, mate. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but, but also, yeah, mate, if, if Wildshoot, yeah, if Wildshoot couldn't have done the workout, like we all know, the only workout of Maz is one by five k or one by ten k, whatever you're racing. So look, workout workouts are good, aren't they? But again, this is what I mean about the shootout here because we then don't know whether Mills or Kurga or even the Goose, if that's a race with all of them in there we don't know who wins mm. and that's what does drive mm. me nuts a bit like because realistically it doesn't matter how you work out what times you run because i look i, I hope these athletes go on and they perform at the olympics okay but we've seen it yeah. time and time again like look we don't have the bowman train here anymore but it's just, it's the same thing we used to say we used to criticize them all the time be like yeah they've come mm. out they've run these fast times where are they going to be in the olympics Oh, okay, yeah, they're not. They're not even in the race. And maybe if they were That's having fair. high quality races fair, most, at this yeah. time of year, then they would they would be performing better. To be fair, Mohammed, medalist, you know, Grant Fisher just outside the medals. They like the t top tier of the Bowman were were always there or thereabouts. But um, yeah, so but that's. That's that's your Boston 5K and 3K. Some some insane insane races and and one thing that I did notice when you watch the races back, if you haven't seen them yet, is because like you said, positions don't matter. Everyone had a turn at the front in those latter stages. Like the race got mm -hmm. to 3K, things started to really break up. Everyone looks knackered, by the way. Like that is high level 5,000 meter running. They are just at it from the off. Like they looked, people were looking uncomfortable two laps in. 400 meters into the race and but no wonder you know they're clipping off 61 62s at that like it's just insane um anyway and like sort of gets the three and a half four k mills he has a turn at the front he's pushing it he's actually forcing it like he's he's trying to drop people and and i think if it's if it's a race race that that doesn't happen you know and and then that easily turns into a 13 10 with a kick maybe they run 13 06 13 07 you know they probably lose 10 seconds from from kind of keying off people at that 4k mark so you know in, in the end like mills came second but he runs 1258 so you know he's he's obviously not bothered about his position at that point um and the same like nagus had a little turn at the front in the in the other heat nico young was like drilling it from far out sam aitken did a lot of the work 3k you know 3k to 4k um and then wild shoot again come comes by him late uh to win the race so those who won actually didn't do crazy amounts of work during the race but i think in contrast to a 5k race maybe on the circuit where you know winning's a little bit more of a big deal in diamond leagues and obviously championship race and no like these guys were just going at it from from two 3k and as soon as the pace had dropped out someone took it up straight away and it was relentless um it really was so strongly recommend i mean both all the races are on youtube go watch them strongly recommend it, it, it fascinating stuff um just seeing these guys just churn out lap after lap after lap um but that's boston and thankfully we'll probably be talking same sort of thing in a couple of weeks time when uh the b valentine rolls around but let's move on to the london international cross country last weekend lum 
Yeah, definitely, mate. And and obviously, it feels like it was a long time ago now since we've had all the all the races since. Um, I think um, I think it's fair to say it was it was a success, wasn't it? Like we we had some good kind of feedback uh, on, on social media. People seemed to be really interested in the event going into it. Kind of we had like quite a, quite a few listens um, for our preview as well. Um, so I think Amon Martin's done a brilliant job there. And and what I what I hope from now, like obviously without even talking about the results of the race or anything like that, what I hope now is that we can just make sure this event keeps going forward and becomes something that happens year after year. I think it's great that they've yep. come out and said, look, it doesn't have to be that same time of year every time. Like they're open to move. I think that. it does. All they want. I, yeah. What well, you're saying it I, it has to be I, that I, time I, of year. I think it does have look, when you look at the cross country calendar or the winter calendar, where are you where are you putting that race? Can't put it on county weekend, which is what a couple of weekends before. I think the weekend before was a league match. Bucks is this weekend. Uh or Southern's sorry is this weekend. Bucks is the weekend after. Um then you've got league match weekend again. Maybe you can put it on a league match weekend. I don't know. Yeah, um, I think I think you, you have to. And or then of course it... it's National Cross. Yeah. Like why mm. for me, Highgate works because everyone knows it's gonna be that time of year. It's gonna be early May. Yeah. I think if it becomes and... a proper world cross um qualifier though. You push it back later, depending on what cross is going to be like. And you just push it back, and the same we said. Obviously, they've got that kind of southern northern match in there. We won that after the southern, so people can qualify realistically, and little things like True. that. So yeah, maybe it could be maybe the week before national cross. It's it's hard. I, I I don't know when's best, but I do think they need to fixate on a date and have it the same time every year. Races. Oh, I think so. I think in future, but what I'm saying is the one they did. I think I think it was I I thought it was cool how Amon was saying that actually just because that was the first one doesn't mean it has to stay there. I think yeah, but kind of once they've kind of found that found the right date, you then stay. But yeah, yeah. I, I, th- maybe, I think there's maybe, there's some wiggle maybe, in there. Maybe they have it pre Christmas. Yeah, maybe they have it pre Christmas. Who knows? But um, yeah, I, I I actually I know a few people went there and and um, said it was a bit. The atmosphere wasn't great. Um, it was a bit empty. Obviously, they had the kind of confusion, unfortunately, with like on not being able to sort of sponsor it and really push it and and make it a bigger event. Um, but look, when Highgate first started, there was a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, like I think it was two hundred people watching. You know, like the whole lane three beer and cheer was was quite scarce. I mean, if you go back and watch Highgate from twenty thirteen, which I think you can do, by the way. It's it's nothing on what it is now, so I think you have got to give this event a little bit of time. Um, obviously, oh, and again, yeah. like, I feel like they'll learn from it as well. I I, I think it's a dynamic. We should it, it should stay. It's an event should stay, and I just hope it grows and grows and grows. Um, and and let's just you know we don't need to go in on it too much, but obviously there was a little bit of a cock up with the with the four k bucks short course on the women's side. Like you know, I think they were. They understood that it was a two lap race, two by two K. They basically sectioned off some of the course early on in the day. And it was the same in the under 13s races. I think under 15 races I was sort of watching because they didn't run them around. I think they must have just run them on like a 1500 meter loop lap. And uh, and obviously you just have the number of laps in your head. You do that number of laps. You think you're finishing. They say, oh no, off you go for one more. Happened in the short course. Positions completely changed. So there's a big muck up basically um, in that sense. So clearly they didn't communicate that to the athletes that courses change. You're going to do three laps instead of two. Um, yeah. So I think uh, some of the athletes are very, very frustrated, understandably. So that was a bit of a muck up. But other than that, I think, look, course, the course to me looked pretty good. I think it was a really, because it was frosty, it was a really undulating course. Like it was rutted, tufty mm-hmm. grass. I don't think it was particularly nice to run on. Yeah, I, I I just think like anything, like you say, like the the early kind of iterations of Highgate maybe didn't have that many people. I think anything like this that is trying to kind of do the right things um, for the sport is only a good thing. Like how many years has British Champs been going on? The crowds are still scarce for that. So like I think it's it's absolutely absolutely fine. Like I, I think in the future it'll be it'll be brilliant. And also they put on a stream which. Is a is a good thing, but at the same time, it means some people feel like well they don't need to go because there's a stream anyway. So, 
um, that was that was good to see. And I think in future, yeah, it's only going to grow, um, especially if they can like ensure they keep having prize money. It means things in terms of selection going forward because as soon as you put prize money for athletes or selection for teams um, on the line, then people are going to show up. Yeah. Mate, so let's talk about the winners. Milner and Keith, uh, Milner and Donnelly, sorry. Um, just do dominated. Like, I mean, Donnelly particularly just absolutely creamed it. Um, Milner, oh, I can't get over how much this guy trains 35 hours, like to put that into context. Like, that's, it's just, we've said it before 100 mile a week equates to about 12, 13, 14 hours a week, maybe tops. He trains 35 hours a week. Obviously, a lot yeah, is, you know, not in but the, the guy's a freak. He looks so easy. I mean, my question is, you know, will will he do the World Cross? Will we see this guy at the World Cross? I hope so. I'd love to. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I on the triathlon so. triathlon schedule, to be honest, but I know normally it's quite kind of quite chill until the summer. So I don't see why not. Mm. Um, and I think we've crossed it like, look, cross country is clearly his best discipline. And what I like about the triathlon for that is that it's not gonna it's not gonna interfere with his cross country too much whereas obviously like we saw previously obviously Alex G's kind of I think he's got so big time in triathlon now that it's too difficult but he's someone that yes he was like brilliant on the cross but he also had some good track performance as well he's made some teams on the track um so that was always going to kind of come to come to impact that but but for someone like Milner at the moment I think there's no reason why the cross shouldn't happen um and it's great to see. And, and you talk about Abby Donnelly and him dominating as well, but they are two of our two of our best cross country runners right now. So you'd expect them to dominate yeah. in what compared to compared to Liverpool, for example, is is always going to be a watered down field. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. I mean, to be fair, on the fields, I thought they were, and that's credit to this event as well. I thought the fields were very strong. Top top <laughs> five, six. Yeah. On each side were you know, on the women's side. Unfortunately, Emilia Quirk dropped out. Neve Britton Hubbard, I think, busted an ankle on the uh, rutted course. But that's only a rumor from what I heard. But um, but like I thought, yeah, top five, six, both men and women, very, very, very strong. Like I think we'll be hard pushed to see the top five or six be that high in quality at the national cross. Uh, maybe it's always the same, and that's what that's what I'm saying. Like. Liverpool is the only time normally you get all the best show up mm. throughout the cross country season, and that and that is a problem if you're kind of pushing cross country as an important event. That is a problem that you only get it once, um, and that's where, to be fair, I think people prefer the cross country to to even a track, for instance, because you see you see more of our best athletes over cross country compete at Liverpool versus compete at British Champs, even sometimes. Mm. But on the track, I mean. Because you have to show up to Liverpool. Mm. Um, I think you're probably right. So. I mean, I'd be interested to see if, uh, I mean, if I was known, I'd be tempted to step on, onto a track because, yeah, the form he's in. I'd love to see what he can do on the track. Shout out to Tom Evans as well, by the way. Huge run from him. He may well be at National Cross. Not sure what his plans fully are. But, but yeah, I mean, quick summary. I thought, cool event. Needs to continue. Let's give it two, three, four years before we decide if it's if it's a winner. Um to be honest with you, um, yeah, man. I mean, is it is it about time to move on to Chris Jones? Because he had some fascinating things to say. It was a, a really, really good episode. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I mean, maybe let's just quickly mention the uh, the what world indoor selection policy. I mean, we'll probably talk about that in more detail in a few in a few weeks' time. Um, but it's, it's more the standards, and it's more they yeah. are limiting numbers. I mean, I, I said I think I already mentioned it actually. And now you know, in that three k, just 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 fifteen men, um, they're looking for. Uh, that's the numbers. So tough, but it could be worse. You could be uh, you could be a high jumper and or a pole vaulter, and they just just twelve people. So <laughs> even harder. But but this is what bugs me, Lum. I mean, like you know, they're limiting the three k. Arguably, probably one of the best events at World Indoors to just fifteen. Um, the fifteen hundred, they're allowing thirty, but. The 60 meters, they're allowing 56. 56 people <laughs> for the 60 meters. I mean, what? So basically, if you're a 60 runner, you can have on your CV that you've been to a world indoors, or you know, and it'd be the same, it's the same with the Olympics, like the sort the sort of waiting. 
And it's just like, yeah, it's easy to be a sprinter and make major championships, let alone all this fucking relay crap where they accept, yeah. you know, where they take a team of 12 to go run four man, you know, four men or women relay. It's just, oh, oh it's, it's bonkers, just, mate. It's, it's absolutely, crazy. and their I, argument I feel like, what, be... why can they have two heat? Yeah. In the three K, mate, the, yeah, they'll, they'll they'll have arguments about kind of how long it takes to get through. And I'm not being funny. This everyone knows the sprints take the longest because they're all bloody full start in half the time, and they it literally do. takes them it takes so longer than long a 10K. to get through. Yeah, I know. Literally a three K, it literally probably is about eight and a half minutes for the men. Like by the t- like, including kind of getting on the track, starting. That's that's what probably two sixty meters yep. in eight minutes. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, but well, I get that. Uh, it, I is, think... it is exciting when you actually when you actually watch the race. Like sprints are exciting, but I, I I'm more just coming at it from you could easily have another three thousand meter heat, like seven, eight, nine, you know, nine, ten minutes worth of. Uh, I would also of argue that like, I'd also that argue that big. right. If you take if you take fifty six sixty meter guys, the guys with the best PB are still going to be the ones that make the final in the three k. However. That is a completely different story in terms of the tactics that come into play. Mm. I'm not being funny. Like over 60 meters, you're not just going to tactics your way through to a final. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, take, I'm not saying just take the top eight on times, but you do not need to whittle it down. There's no one that's going to come through and just like kind of PB, PB, PB through the rounds realistically um, and make the final out of nowhere. Whereas the 3K, you see a guy. Yeah, you see a guy in the 3K who might sneak the final and then someone falls and he just has a really good tactical race and and finishes like fourth, third, whatever it is. That is way more likely. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought I'd highlight that because, you know, obviously standards are fierce um, as well. And and GB, uh, with just same rule as they've had outdoors, will just take, uh, obviously, if you bank the standards, you can go, but... Otherwise, they'll have to deem you as top eight worthy for, for them to take you on, on ranking points. Um, so, yeah, worth keeping on those ranking uh, points regarding World Indoors. Yeah, let, let's get into this Chris Jones episode, though, because one thing that um, we are kind of looking at distance-wise is British Athletics, UKA, um, never sure which way around it is, are clearly investing in um, in sort of this endurance strategy that Chris Jones is heading up. So. Chris kind of spoke to us about that um, and we'll let him do the talking because he's the best man um, for that job. So enjoy this episode. Okay, first off, Chris, just welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Um, do you mind just talking us through your what actually is your job role at British Athletics? Like, what's the full title? Because I don't actually know. Okay, the, the current role is... Um... So, head of endurance strategy for, for UK athletics. So that's for endurance. So the, the the job title is head of endurance strategy. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. What does that involve, Chris? Well, it's interesting when the conceptual sort of role of this was. Um, there was a lot of discussion about two years ago about after the um, where Barry's position was positioned, Barry Fudge, and where he was very focused on that just that small group of the world class program. That was his remit, really. And probably people ask questions, why wasn't he doing other things? Well, to be fair to Barry, that wasn't his remit at that time. So then as they came into the position of looking at things, I was doing some consultancy work and I said, clearly, you've got a role of the world-class program and then you've got a, work, a role of someone looking at the overall strategic direction. So the strategic direction really is about aligning everything through the home nations that sits under the world-class endurance strategy. So we can track a young athlete through England, Scotland or Wales on a tracking system but actually we know that, say, at the point when athletes who are going in, in the careers right now are coming to end, we want to know how many people are coming through. We want to know where they are. We want to know what the environments are. We want to look at actually how we can improve those environments as well as a long-term strategic uh, aim of obviously quality assuring what's going on around the country in a sense, not the coaching, but more the resource. So coaches get a better level of resource and support in those environments like St. Mary's, Birmingham, Leeds, Loughborough, they're the key areas. And then the home nations, obviously, are Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So aligning that has never been done before. And that's been the critical piece of work that we've been doing. Yeah, brilliant. Obviously, that's like a 
an overview and, and obviously you mentioned kind of a long-term vision but what does that actually look like for you on a typical week's basis because I know obviously you're coaching as well so how do you actually work kind of day by day and how does that kind of influence that sort of stuff? Yeah so for example I've got a real close link working with England at the moment so obviously England have got a large percentage of what we're talking about in that talent framework so working closely with Tom Craggs, Hayley Hemmings, um, I've got an advisory meeting which I have advisory meetings every second month and in that role i'd work with um all the home nations all the key people around the hub framework and the next meeting is actually tomorrow at one o'clock in st mary's and then obviously by monthly we meet then off the back of that we we obviously talk about policy we talk there's always constant updating of policy the policy design of where that's aligned with world athletics or european standards so and instead of keeping people in the dark, it's actually working with a group of people or the key people in those areas to actually to be able to communicate better in that space and make people aware of what we're trying to do and what the challenges are. And so it's not just seen as an obscure decision. There's, there's, there's a rationale behind what we're trying to do in some of those areas. Mm. That's one area of the role. The other part of the job on the ground would be um, uh, obviously looking at like then working with things like... Um, the sports science and resource team of actually looking, well, what are the, it's, it's, again, it's easy to work at the top end of the sport, what it takes to win. But the coaches in the framework, they don't know those things. They don't know what it takes to develop to a certain thing. And the gap between what's been going on in the world class area and the gap between coaches and people around the framework and the home nations, it's been too big. And there's not enough information out there or stats around there to say, well, you know, it's easy to say, someone's going to get to a certain level, but actually there are milestones on the way. And if you want to become a 13 or 5,000 meter runner, then there are certain things that need to be done to get there. And so we tend to throw a lot of things when people arrive at that point, but we don't throw enough of people on the way to that point. And I think that's what the strategy is trying to change big time. I think a lot of people listening would, would probably agree with that over the past few years. Um, from what it sounds like then, British Athletics will use the home nations to kind of help and develop that talent a bit more and almost feed them, you know, those athletes who are linked with the home nations, feed them into the BA, to the BA system and the BA setup. Is that almost like what's going to, what's going to happen? Yeah. hundred percent. I think it's too late in some cases when people arrive at a certain point because the standards now, as we all agree here today, are globally through the roof. We've seen that change of mm -hmm. performance standards. We see that we can match it globally at 8 and 15, and that's what we're comfortable with. We say the strategy is very good at. And our cultural, should we say, heritage of BMC mm -hmm. and things lend us to that sort of space. And then above that, it becomes a very bespoke model where we need a lot more information around someone like a Will Barnacle coming through. We need to get that information to him and his coach now, not when he's trying to knock at the door in four or five years' time. We need to be helping those guys. So there's probably like a, a bigger sort of... Um, resource being thrown at the home nations to, to develop a pathway and an awareness, competition framework, national standard protocols to help someone like a Tim Eglin with Barnico, Will Barnico, to mm -hmm. say, well, look, if you hit these sort of things and your threshold and your parameters and all the rest of it around there, instead of keeping them in the dark, how do I get there? How do I actually cross that gap? Because that gap's a chasm now at certain levels at 510 and particularly with the men's marathon. So, it's a, so that's where the work is being done. So you're absolutely right. So we have to have an alignment between all the home nations and what we're trying to do. And as those programs evolve, what Tom Craig's doing in England or Mark is doing in Scotland and Steve Mitchell in Wales is I should be able to sit down and talk about, okay, where's the talent? What does that look like? What do the profiles look like? And then we can both work together to help those individual, shall we say, talents that are coming through that process instead of crossing his fingers and just waiting for them to arrive. And I think we, we owe that to as a UK resource to the home nations to actually help them get there. Mm. This Without is that, we are not going to be successful. Simple. Mm. This is interesting. You talk about a gap at the at the world class level, and people have been practicing that world class level for a few years. And then you know, let's say you know, a male thirteen thirty runner um, compared to a male thirteen flat runner. Like, what are what are the differences in practices um, that you've kind of identified over the last few years? I think. The difference of the two things is a little bit more understanding of actually the design, the program design, and also then they're doing it a little bit in the dark. We've all read the Norwegian method. We've all read about more monitoring testing. And is it something that the hub framework should be offering those 1330-type coach-athlete pairs to be working and monitoring and helping them get that information? 
that gives more detail around, around what those programs should look like instead of just say uh, keep going and you know, keep trying it. You know, actually we we can create more of a, a better resource around that framework. As an advisory group, we can actually look at that. Well, what is it that's missing in that space? And we might be saying there's not enough monitoring in there for those athletes like you've just identified around 1330. So how can we go about that? What is it? Do we need more PhD students in Birmingham, Leeds, or whatever? What do we need to actually help those athlete coach pairs get that resource? So that's exactly what we're trying to do by helping close that gap. Mm. Obviously, the strategy now, as you've outlined, sounds brilliant. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, what ex- what actually existed before this? Is this something that sort of, have you evolved like a previous tra- strategy since you come into the role or is it something that actually didn't exist at all? I think, t- to be fair, in a sense, there was, there was lots of elements of it there. All. There were lots of mm. elements in Wales, a little bit in England, in, in different areas, shall we say, but nothing was pulled together. And it was actually trying to get people in a room and say, look, we owe it to ourselves in a sense of these jobs are a borrowed job. I've always done believe that wherever I've worked in what organization. So it, it's our it's it's our responsibility to try put a, a framework in place. So, you know, you could say the elephant in the room where all the home nations are doing their own things. So Scotland and Wales are very supported by institutes of sport. So they can get their hands on the resource, but they've only got small talent pools. The major piece is England. So England doesn't have that direct funding or that direct resource from a sports council like Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. So that was the key piece to actually get those guys in one place and say, okay, you've created a framework with the hubs, but now it's time to align that. And for the next four, this next refinement period um, of the next 12 months is to refine that. So the next four years is that there are standard protocols in Leeds, Birmingham, and there are standard protocols on competency frameworks there are a review process where someone like myself can work with England and go in and say, okay, who is the talent in this certain event group in England? What does that look like? What's the profile look like? Where's the performance gap, what you've just been talking about? And how can we plug that gap? How can we help you resource that gap? Is it coach mentoring? Is it sports science? What is it that helps that 1330 run that you just described to come up to a 1310 at least? So those are the right environments. So we've got the environments now. And I think the environments now need to be refined. I think also not just to fixate on, you know, Chris Jones is going down a hub framework. It's not that. It's actually creating a network of environments that somebody outside that environment, say around the St. Mary's environment, for example, can access that resource as well. That's what's really important. But it just it, it's, it's transient for athletes going through university, as we know. But after that stage, it's also important that if athletes don't go off the US or they're not in shoe running groups, the fact is that those coaches have got a confidence and a resource that's there. And that's what's really important that's there and they can ask the questions and they know they can have the confidence of that support as well. And that's where we're working with England at the moment to really get that in place. I'm talking a lot here, but we're also then creating, um, through the strategy, we're creating like a national dashboard. And the dashboard would track little Johnny at 16 years of age running 148.5 right through up to the world-class standards. And then it, it goes through like a Commonwealth Games development potential and Commonwealth Games standard onto the world class. And all those levels have obviously got performance tracking against them. It's aligned to what it takes to be the best at, at the world level. So on that dashboard, on that dashboard, we're working with UKSI at the moment to launch that. And that needs to be launched by October for the next four-year cycle. What that will identify is you guys came to me in another podcast and said, Chris, can you tell us, What's the scores on the doors in Leeds, Loughborough, or Wales, for example? And you want to know about 815 or steeplechase? I could show you exactly who's on that tracking system, and I could show you exactly what the athlete coach pair is. And then also, when we meet off the advisor group, the aim of the advisor group is then to break into different groups. So we've got the mountain and trail group. We will break off and have a mountain, uh, sorry, a marathon specific group, and they'll have an 815 group. Luke Dunn's lead going to lead on a strategic direction of improving the steeplechase. So those are the subgroups. So when I meet those subgroups with the dashboard, it will identify every athlete in the country that sits in a certain bracket. So then we've, we've got an understanding there where the um, athlete coach pairs are sitting and actually sometimes where the performance gaps are as well. So that's mm-hmm. where it, it engages more. Communication should be stronger. Awareness what it takes to develop should be there because those obviously those discussions at a high level are taking place all the time. Whereas I think before, what the difference was, it happened at the very high level in a very bespoke mo 
and a few athletes around that, which was a fantastic piece of work. However, it wasn't cascading down. And in the home nations and in other areas, we didn't know what the, that information was to actually what it takes to develop athletes at a world-class level. Mm. This is interesting. I mean, you mentioned people outside of those hubs, but in the area having access to these sorts of you know facilities yeah. or practitioners. And I think that is happening from, from what I know on the ground already. Several people I know yeah. in the St. Mary's area, they are able to get access to, you know, whether it be psychologists and people like that and not be directly linked with that hub. So I think that's good. There's a knock-on effect there. But you talk about these talent pools and stuff. You've got, let's say you've got eight, you know, eight women or, or eight men in one of these talent pools over eight and 1,500. How do you decide um, as a governing body who's going to be a good investment? Um, is it just a case of monitoring and just seeing who comes out on top over the course of a year? Or, you know, how do you decide who to kind of focus on? Because obviously we know there are limited spaces on the world-class performance program, futures program, and and so on. I think that's that's been the, the, the um, should we say, the elephant in the room, is that Wales have had their own standards, England and Scotland have had their own standards. But if there is a system that says, um, which there is actually, and we've got those tables, which probably one of these podcasts might be to go through the strategy itself, which might be an insight of exactly where the data is. And we can do that probably at some time. Uh, we've got to present it to UK Sport. Um, next month, we've presented it to board. It's obviously see, well, it goes to UK Sport next month, but I'd happily come on here and present it to you guys. That's no problem at all. But what yeah, it shows is that, what it shows, that, just for example, it shows four athletes. We need four years after Olympic Games, we need so many athletes at this standard. Then there's the next bracket down, and we need so many athletes supporting that, and then obviously another bracket down there. What that actually does, it falls into a work program for, well, actually, it's your responsibility at this point here with the home nations to produce as many athletes there. So that's answering the question of actually how do you identify that athletes are in that tracking system at that point? So if we need four female later meter runners, let's say inside 147, uh, 157, sorry, um, at that top end four years out, then that's what we need. And if we need another 16 at around two, two or one, then that's what we need. And then we need two or three, four, for example. And those aren't exactly the figures because I'm not in front of me. But what I'm actually trying to show you is that automatically when I put the um, the system in place, I can go to Luffman and say, at oh, these levels here, how many people you've got in there? Where are they? What's the athlete coach pair? What's the level of resource there? So there's a reason, a logic, why someone's come onto that space. Does that make sense? That's mm -hmm. a reason. So anything above that, the world class level, we've been in that top bracket, and that's where we're being, so we say, scrutinised by UK sport about where the investment goes, and it is for that Olympic. Um, obviously, it's that Olympic investment, it's a world class investment, and that's that's the remit of UK sport. There's no point in getting hung up on that. That's not going to change because there's only so much investment to go around. But what we can do better is actually do the alignment bit that I've just been talking about through the process of the home nations and bring that into the right space. So instead of people like we have coaches talking about, you know, I'm, my youngster's got a lot of talent, they're going to make it. It's actually, does it fall in the, into the right sort of area of development? And does that athlete have the right characteristics? So we can get the right, type of information and profiling through the home nations on that sort of tracking system and that's what we should be doing so that then helps support the athlete coaches um, and then obviously investment in coach development alongside that as well yeah brilliant it'll be um it'll be great to kind of chat through that doc like you say at some point chris um and obviously as well we look yeah. forward to kind of seeing how the strategy unfolds in the next few years one thing we also yeah. wanted to ask you on the podcast, podcast, of course, is um, obviously there's some scientific elements uh, to kind of some of the suggestions you're making. But what's your kind of background in the sport, just for the people listening? Because I know you previously worked in triathlon as well. Is this something that they've been doing in that sport for, for a while now? Yeah, it's interesting. My background is um, obviously I was a head coach of British triathlon for a while. Um, I coached several world championships in that space. And then I changed roles to more of a management role. So I then was more of a, a PD. So I was performance director in Ireland for a period and then went head of endurance in Ireland. Then I came back head of, obviously, for Wales part-time. So um, my, my background isn't a science. I've had a fascination in that area for a long time. And I think like anybody, you know, you, you're you constantly learning and evolving in that space. Um, so, that, you know, that's my career in short in 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 sport, really. I've done a consultancy roles out in 
uh, Belgium. I advised the Belgian Federation for quite a few years at the Institute of Sport there. But that's when you engage with people like Jan Albrecht and um, uh, Tim Morrow and people like that, those coaches that you get to know and build those relationships. And you'll always have, I had a fascination, that probably what I've never done and probably never really wanted to do is like a big a big group thing. That would never be me. It's not not my personality. I'm not that sort of person. I prefer the one-to-one or just a few people and I'm more happy with the detail and that's just who I am. You know, that's that's what I enjoy doing. Um, and then there's also like anybody in these roles is is keeping a balance between, you know, the, what you do in this job, and, which is obviously consuming. Um, but at the same time, you've got to enjoy it and keep a balance for the rest of your life. You know, that's what I try to do. Mm. Talk about one-to-one relationship. You enjoy your coaching as well. Um, you've obviously coached some ter- terrific athletes in your time and a new athlete you're coaching that we just wanted to ask you about is, is of course, Mark Scott. We've been speaking to him a little bit as well. So um, how did that relationship come about? And what I want to know is when you start working with a new athlete like that, an established athlete, how do you kind of know what to change, what to keep? Is that just kind of got instinct, your experience? Um, or, do you, you know, it's an interesting topic, that one. It's a really good question. I thought you might have that one. Um, in a, in a sense of actually, I've always got on with Mark. I've always connected with Mark mm. really well. Um, I mean, we've always discussed things quite openly. Uh, obviously, the Bauman model it was doing, you touch, talk about those. And um, I like, you know, obviously talked about his ability to do the amount of work that he was doing. Um, and then when he came back and dropped out of the Oregon, he was sort of, Steve Vernon was sort of overseeing mm. and just in discussion on where he was going and this and um and he was just talking about more detail around things, and um, and then he rang, and we had a conversation around things, and uh, and like at that point, you know, it doesn't work if the athlete doesn't have ownership. Is 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 a world class athlete? I asked to look at his data, and I looked at all the, the things around Mark, and um, obviously he's incredibly talented. Um, his numbers are very good, um, and obviously it's about keeping him healthy. So, and then it's about obviously looking at. Um, you can describe marathon runners as a diesel and you got one as a Porsche. He's the Porsche. He's got more speed, more VO2. And so it's actually then managing a program around that, not to disrupt that too much, like you've just said, but it's also then like, okay, how can we go after the efficiency and develop the strength in this guy to get him to do what I believe he can do in the future? So um, that's obviously then obviously going, you start the program design. Uh, you, you very... Um, I can say he's very engaging and he's very interested in the detail. And the one thing that we've talked about already is that is a difference. He was in a very large group, 20 people. And he, he had, he's probably get something given twice a week and that's what we're doing. Whereas this is probably slightly different. And that's what he wanted is a, a real level of communication. When I've been on with him today from Kenya and just talking about tomorrow's workout and what we want from that workout. And he's really engaging in that. And, he, and he's taking ownership. It's like a two-way conversation with a very mature athlete mm-hmm is very established versus telling somebody what to do. Mm. And, you know, when you explain about, you know, fat utilization, slow, uh, you know, developing that system, you know, just be careful in that area. We don't want to get drawn in. He's, he's got a really good handle on all of those things. So, you know, it's for me, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to work and help with Mark and support Mark. But, you know, it will be an area of like where we'll be looking at um, like things in the lab. We might possibly look at Moxie. We'll probably be looking at like... Um, working really closely with Milton on like the carb ingestion sort of elements of how much you can absorb and how much you need to absorb grams per, per hour. Um, and he knows all that. And that's what we're working on already. Those are the bits. So you, you've got some, you've got incredible ability, but you're trying to bring that level of detail to say, well, if we get this right, mm-hmm. there's no reason to count run X, you know? So that's what we'll try to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's brilliant. And it relates to some of the things you chatted about earlier, doesn't it? Around kind of the difference at that high level, being able to kind of draw upon people like Morton, et cetera, get all this lab stuff. How much yeah. will you actually be able to see, Mark, sort of on a one-to-one basis, or will a lot of it be remote? No, I think like when he's in Kenya, he's in Kenya, but then when he's back in the UK, we agree, you know, particularly in, in key areas on those key sessions, you know, at least minimum once, twice a week, if I can get to him, you know what I mean? And vice versa, we've agreed that he'd come this way as well. Um and also, if I wasn't there, then it's quite easy in this role to say to Andy Shaw, the physiologist, I need that session monitoring. And that's the way it goes. And we can get that resource around him. Or I can get Cam, uh, the nutritionist, 
and we're looking at the carb absorption and that sort of stuff. We can do that as well, you know. We're, um, so there's, there's a lot of that sort of thing we can be doing, and obviously uh, we got some things where we're looking at um, potential um, work in Portugal. Um, it comes into Barcelona, then off the back of that we'll we'll have a pause, and then we'll have the block then that leads him. I'm sure you know he's heading, he's, he's he's running London, and that's what the, that's what the the piece of work's about, really. Mm. So obviously you work with Mark on a on a one to one basis, but are these the you know this is the level of detail for those listening that all British athletes at that top top level they are going through. I mean you've just been in South Africa as well, and it does seem to you know they Morton seem to be quite groundbreaking with what they're doing, um, and I'm sure you've you know you know seen sodium bicarb and the testing around that and how that's benefiting especially those eight and fifteen runners. Um, is it a bit of a yeah, is it a bit of a kind of new new era when it comes to fueling? Because I feel like, you know, yes, we've got super shoes, but the mass and the fueling seems to have taken a whole nother level as well. I think you're spot on. I think you're absolutely spot on. I think we've seen the new change and it's here. The shoes are here. There's no point in debating whether they work or they don't work. The fact is people are gaining a huge advantage from that side of it. And the game changer is nutrition. The game changer is absolutely nutrition. The ability to take on around 100 to 120 grams of carbohydrate per hour and that's what the top guys are doing, because when you're running at the speeds that they're running at now, that's you know that that isn't a fat burning process. The fat burning process supports that, but you're burning huge amounts of glycogen and being able to sustain that speed. So we know that. So it's getting that and getting that information and getting it into the process. So you know it's not just fueling the key sessions. It's actually getting the athletes on their longer, slower type runs when they're out for an hour and forty two hours that they're gradually real, ramping up this incremental tolerance to 100, 120 grams per hour. So that's how you want to get the, the system to be able to cope with it first, and then you're moving that into running uh, five times 5K at a specific marathon pace, and you can absorb that without any um, gastric issues and, and that sort of thing. So there's a process going through that to get to that, really. And um, I think you know the rest of the world are doing that. I mean, if you see Blumenfield and what the Norwegians are doing, with the moxie you've seen the moxie have you guys seen that no just to go through that with us break that down so the moxie is like a is is a mask and it's like a, it's it's a, it's a it's a breath by breath system but what it's actually showing you instead of taking a lactate on the end of it it's showing a percentage world two that's in the system so you can actually train and gives you a gauge of what you're training with so it might be scaled on that gauge to a certain point that says you are 32 percent or two in that system at that run at that time and what they're saying is that, you know, that the, the, there are elements of changing three months training in general, should we say, to get adaptation. But they're, they're moving that process a lot quicker because the detail of how every run is being done. And then when they bring them into the lab, they're seeing the figures change and the data. So we're not quite at that. But I believe, and discussion with Steve recently and Andy Shaw, is that we should be at that. And that's where we need to get to with a couple of these particular athletes who are looking at those longer distances and things. I think that's where that that element is, you know, I think we're double thresholding. I think we're doing lactates with certain athletes that suit that profile because it definitely doesn't suit everybody. Um, but there's elements where we are doing it and some are doing it well. And then there are other elements where we're doing single and extending and controlling. So that understanding, I would say, is there in British athletics and across quite a few of the key coaches. Um, and then what I do say about our coaches is there's a real high skill level amongst some of our coaches that, really do produce athletes at a, at a high level and um, we don't all have to speak the same language or understand the same things but you know when you're around the environments like in Poch and you know you see John Berg and you see um, Jeff working and those sort of guys they know what they're doing they've got an instinctive feel to what they're doing and they also know elements as well but they're not quite working with the moxie that they don't need to do. And Trevor Painter, world-class Saint Dimitri coach. So we've got those guys around that can do that in that area really, really well. And we've also got the resource around like the bicarb and things that they need that's specific to those events. So just because I'm talking about that moxie, it doesn't, it's not necessary for everybody, hmm. but I think it could actually play a key role in different areas of the sport. You know. Do you have, yeah. just a quick one from me, do you have numbers on the difference um, you know, taking 120 grams of carbs can have on an athlete in a marathon compared to if they're taking 20 grams, you know, in an hour? I don't, but, you know, that would be simple to test in a sense of actually if someone's running at a marathon pace on a treadmill for a window of like an hour and you want to give someone 20 or 40 grams and someone 120, 
obviously you'd see the, the values change in the breathing RER of what it's costing them on that treadmill. So we can measure those things, but obviously mm. um, what we're seeing is that um, it's more efficient in that second half, and particularly we're seeing people, I don't mind saying Clara Evans, ran the last is five, she ran the fastest 5K of the last 5K in Valencia. Mm. She only did that because she was up at 80 to 100 grams of mm. wow. carbs an hour. And that's Clara yeah. Evans. Yeah. And, you know, we, you know, Clara Evans is, is a very good working runner and her talent is that she just happens to be able to absorb the amount of work that's needed for that event. But she can only run, or well, she's only run 15.49 and she's only run 70 minutes for a half, but she's translated that to 2.25. So there's an element there of actually getting that fueling right shows what can be done. I think that's probably a good example of that. Mm. Yeah, like you say, a great example of kind of maximising for the right event rather than just training kind of for training's sake. Yeah, um, I, I think yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's where, you know, I think um, you know we can be better in that space of actually getting that education, supporting, uh, you know, a lot of our athletes into that space, understanding, you know, how they need to develop that, that, that as part of the programme, that it's just normal that they're taking those sort of figures in that preparation window, particularly in the marathon, you know. Yeah, brilliant. Right, just before we finish then, Chris, we just wanted to ask you kind of a couple of questions about kind of, I guess if you, you had like blue sky thinking now, if you could change one thing that would kind of benefit British distance running, what would it be? Like if you could kind of do anything you wanted? Again, it's the, it's, it's the golden egg, isn't it? It's finance. And finance, finance at the top will always be enough. And, you know, we, we invest in altitude, we invest in lots of things for our very, very top athletes. But it's the same question that I was asked when I left British Triathlon. And I'm probably going to answer it exactly the same way. That the investment through the stages of development needs to be much higher. It needs to be much higher. And it needs to be identified when they've hit these certain brackets. And then you need to invest in coaching with it. So there's more coaches on the ground to the whole network. And those coaches then become on a formal learning path, path, pattern. They become part of a framework. They become valued. Um, and then the detail of what we're looking for goes into, into there. Because I just think, like you both, I have, we've seen so many young people come into this sport mm. and then obviously not quite fulfill what they should have done. And, I, and, I, and it's, it's not to do with um, their talent. It's not to do with their individual talent sometimes. It's to do with actually the environments have actually been keeping them in those environments for longer. Um, and I think that's, to me, if we could change that, if we could change that part of it. And, you know, you can spot on other people. They've got their lens appear on the Olympics and their output and where their investment goes. But as a governing body and as, as a custodians of the sport, that's what I would like to see change. Mm. So that there is uh, a value added into some of those areas, and that obviously costs money. So it's not that you know I understand that it's difficult to invest such a broader type program, but I, I still think it would be the best model that we could create. Mm. I think that's good to hear because it's almost frightening the talent we have who are receiving next to nothing. You know, it's uh, them and yeah, coach. Yeah. yeah, it's it's frightening how many people are on the door knocking on the door. How how are you going to go about educating? coaches as well as athletes um and you've mentioned some pretty technical stuff on this podcast so far so how would you go about educating coaches that sort of thing so they can start start to implement it i think the coaches are there and i think actually the environment's there for the coaches i think through the hubs we should have standardized formal sort of workshops we show where we where we inform coaches and we keep and this is what i'm talking about in my role the gap from where the world-class program was it never cascaded down but it needs to cascade down and that's where the hub and the advisor group plays a huge role and the information in the advisor group is cascading back into the hubs and into the hub framework. And the people who are in those positions have a responsibility. If you're in charge of a hub or you're in charge of a home nation, you have a responsibility also to develop coach development in your hub framework and home nation. And that should be aligned to an overall UK strategy. And that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, to, to be, Fair to Jack, who's obviously new in the role, coming into that role and the conversation we have, is hugely a fan of the hubs and hugely supportive of actually what we're trying to do. And obviously we talk about finance and things, but what I'm actually trying to do, the philosophy of what we're trying to do is definitely there. 
and the, and we do need to invest in coaches and we do need to um, create a world class resource. Um, um, you know, we've talked about just just silly things like um, death and retirement in London that time. Can we get the group of coaches around? And mm. it's that type of information that people want to know and discuss. Henri Holt from Holland has done a lot of work in the past and still continues to do that in Ireland. But you need people with specific area of knowledge, whether it's nutrition or physiology, um, to start working with our coaches. And before people, I think I imagine that coaches just feel that they're sometimes just left. They're just left in a vacuum of getting all on my own, happen to have a conversation, and you build up your own networks. And I, you know, obviously, I try to talk to as many people as I can. I always have done. But I, but I do believe there needs to be a formal process to that. So workshop in St. Mary's, workshop in Birmingham, workshop in, and that's what we need to do. And that's what we're working towards over the, over the next four years. We're in a refinement stage at the moment. We've got the strategy. As I say, I'm happy to go through that with you. You'll see where that's leading, and then it'll show you then that we're putting a competitive framework out there that's going to be national and working in line to all the home nations. Off the back of that, we then want more of a, a reviewing process that helps those people and a little bit more accountability in those roles that are actually leading Loughborough or leading Birmingham or leading there. And it's not being big brother. It's actually saying it's aligned. It's a system that aligns. And if there is a system that aligned, I can go, Steve Vernon could go, Luke Gunn could go, but it continues to grow with maturity. Mm. Programs become good when they've got good program maturity. Programs don't become good when they stop start. And in my view, there's been too much stop start. The reason why triathlon is good and where it is right now is even back when I was there, they've matured, it's gone better and it's refined and it's got better again. And that's what they've done. They've done that very, very well. The small, they can control it, they're centralized. We're decentralized, and that's probably what is the bigger challenge. So why not use those semi 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 centralized models around what I've just been talking about? Bring in the community. It's like in St. Mary's with the Hoka group right now and Andy Obdell. Why can't they access? that system, why shouldn't they be around there and feel equal to that process of what we're trying to do? That's to me, that to me would be the footprint that would actually then do something really special. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Chris. And I, th I think that's a great place to end. And I'm sure kind of our listeners will really appreciate kind of the fact that you've been so open about it because we don't often hear from people from the NGBs and actually talking about these processes. We just see kind of the name strategy. We see maybe a document here and there, but it's great that you've, you've agreed to do that. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure, guys. Anytime. And So great to hear from Chris Jones there talking about that new endurance strategy um, for British athletics. I think for me, also positive, he's just talking about the that level under under the elite. He kind of highlighted that actually we've had our super elites have always had the support they need. They've always managed to find the funds for that. But actually, it's ensuring that athletes kind of make that transition through. Um, I know, Matt, it's something you're really passionate about as well, kind of with your junior to senior camp and things like that. So. I think I think it's great to see they're doing this on a on a kind of nationwide level, especially with you mentioned sort of England athletics being the one that's been a bit behind just because of the amount of athletes they've had. Whereas we've always I think we've seen as well just kind of friends that you've had in the sport who, if you're kind of Scottish or Welsh, you're just a lot more known to your your kind of individual national governing body just because there's so many less athletes at that level um but it's great to see chris has taken charge of some of that and I, and I really appreciate actually that someone from british athletics was so happy to speak openly and honestly um because it's something we definitely haven't had loads of um in the past obviously we've had a few guests on this podcast um so not about them but kind of just historically it's not always been the most open form of communication has it mm. Totally agree, man. Um, I think Chris, you know, like you said, Chris summed it up when he, when he spoke of, of of that gap between the the what the elite elite are practicing. You know, those those top eight, top ten, top fifteen in the world, what they're practicing, and and what those who are, you know, forty, fiftieth in the world, and and it's there is a gulf. There's there's a big gap there, and actually, you know, look at George Mills. This weekend, I mean, he's someone who, you know, when he was Brian Phoenix under John Big, had a lot at his disposal. But let's be honest, he's moved to OAC Europe, and you know, they just do things on a whole nother level. Like, is there a box those guys don't tick? 
and and you know he's transformed i guess with age as well what's to say he wasn't going i mean i don't think he was ever going to be a sub 30 minute 5k runner under john big but maybe that's unfair to say but you know he is now and and i do think that is just because of you know what he's got at his disposal um in terms of training and and science and and support teams and and the life he lives i mean how many months of the year does he spend at altitude he's he's on a he's on camp 11 months of the year basically so i think you know chris chris highlighted so many things about you know he they want to facilitate coaches and athletes and actually make them aware of of the difference because so many people can you know if you're on the male side i think you can virtually get run 13 30 no support at all right that would probably be like the quicker. limit of you know maybe I think maybe think, quicker yeah. i mean i mean the wheelies have done it right so yeah they're running 13 25 yeah. and they get they get absolutely no support at all but but um but then but then yeah like when you look you're like probably maxing it out they've probably maxed out mm. their level how do they go run 13 0 and you know the answer is yeah the, the science ba seemed to be you know when chris is talking about that moxie <laughs> yeah and that's something british athletics aren't even looking at massively yet um well, exactly. and obviously he was talking about that in relation to in relation to mark scott as well super exciting to see that they're going to be working together um and great to see that mark it seems has kind of refocused a bit and found found his found his groove like with with, a, with kind of having a proper coach again um because he's kind of been between coaches a little bit um since he left btc um so great to see there and, and obviously like we, we mentioned these the boston 5k's earlier in the episode he's someone that really took advantage of those and let's hope he can kind of take some of that speed into into the marathon um when he goes in london kind of in, in a few months now because we're going to be previewing marathons before we know it um so that'll be that'll be good too but yeah again great to hear from chris um and as we mentioned in the podcast definitely someone will look to get back on um to discuss some of this strategy further uh because I think once that's once that's kind of outlined, he mentioned to us that he's really happy to to share some of that. So again, thanks to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's just good to know that that I, I really do think British athletes are taking a step forward um, in developing, you know, up and coming endurance talent, and, and you know, even just talent IDing people from from an early age and just having them on their radar. Um, I, I think it's encouraging and and using these hubs to their full advantage as well um so and and they're not you know they're, they're, they're not trying to coach anyone um they recognize their coaches have done a fantastic job and we do have a lot of talented coaches out there which i think that is probably the biggest difference to maybe 10 years ago i think mm. they they i think british athletics as a as an organization didn't believe that coaches who were coaching homegrown talent were you know were able to take athletes to the next level um and they thought you know their coaches knew better um which is that's a you know discussion for another day but i think that's the that's the reality of it 10 years ago whereas i think that that mentality um is changing a little bit un under chris jones and, and the team there steve vernon as well so uh it's good, good to see yeah should we um should we look ahead then uh because obviously look ahead. plenty more races to come like obviously we've kicked off that boston meet but to remind everyone it's it literally it remind myself i mean still only the end of January. There's plenty more um, indoor to go. There's plenty more cross country to go. Obviously, Bucks cross country is next weekend. Um, so thanks for the guys hosting at Leeds for sending through that start list um, for us for that. They're, the race is always looking looking good. Like I think the, the women's side particularly is looking pretty strong. Um, but I, I, me and Matt were kind of saying, I don't know if it's just because we're a bit older now, um, a bit kind of out of that under 20 scene um, that... To me, they don't seem as strong maybe as they have been um, in recent years, particularly on the men's. There still are obviously some great athletes in there. Um, but I remember when we were at uni, for example, I remember Callum Hawkins winning a Bucks um, and things like that, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think Mohammed took it last year, didn't he? Um, I mean, the women's field last year was just, I was, you know, when we were, when we were looking at previewing this, I was sort of scanning back last year at those results, and Megan Keith was what fifth. I still baffles me now. Um, Alex Millard won. Amelia Quirk was in there second. Neve Britton Hubbard, like it was Harry Donnelly. 
you know, the, Abby Donnelly was third. Like that, that, that mm -hmm. women's race last year. Um, if they had all those people return, that would be in, that would be you know some matchup. Um, but you have still got a good few returners: Mila Quirk, Nee Bridgen Hubbard. I mean, Beth Morley. Look out for her because she the Yorkshire Cross. She just won the four K trial as well. So and she's very good. Even you know eight K, nine K, ten K cross runner. So I think she's going to be well up there fighting for the medals uh, for Loughborough. Elena Bolton studying at Leeds now. Yeah, she she's someone who national cross medalists um when she's on form. I mean Uraka, Abby Ives, I presume Ives will, will do the short course. Maybe she'll do the long course of Birmingham. But um yeah, I presume she'll do short course, look to try and win that maybe. Um but but yeah, I mean and then on the men's side, like again, yeah, Mohammed Mohammed, you know, he won it last year and Estonia, those guys obviously aren't in it this year. Um but you got Barnick, I mean you know, we you say about Callum Hawkins and that Barnico again, like the, he he's an animal. We still don't know how good the guy is, just because he doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, he he doesn't go run Boston meets. He doesn't he, he doesn't put himself on the line when 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 it's over time. Yeah, he loves winning, and and he's don't forget this guy's gearing towards World Cross. He told us that I fully expect him to absolutely dominate Bucks Cross. He's been away oh, mate, training. Don't get me wrong. I'm excited. I'm excited to see him race. To be honest, like I'd rather that than see him kind of just jog around at Boston and run a time. So I, uh, <laughs> no, no, definitely. Oh god. <laughs> nah, I'm, I, I'm not too much of a Boston hater for those listening, but I just, I have. Uh, oh, I don't yeah. know. I, I, I'd much rather see people slog around a cross country race. To be honest, but um, yeah, now nah, well, I'll be there, mate. Great to see. Yeah, good, good. Uh, what I would say as well, and I think I've said this before on the podcast, like I think it's great that I know Loughborough do it, that all their scholars, so anyone getting scholarship, has to do a Bucks meet every year. So just because their cross maybe is not as strong as we've seen like it was last year, it means their outdoor team or their indoor team, for example, is going to be super strong um, on that. And I, and I think that's a really good policy to have rather than necessary just... Mm. Letting athletes come, make the most of the scholarship facilities. Yeah, obviously, like you're, you're at level, whatever. Um, but I think they've always, um, they've always gone through and said that if to get this scholarship at the university, um, for your athletics, you have to compete in a bucks meet each year. And I think that's why they continue to be the strongest, like with the most depth, like year on year, consistently, is that they actually making a case. I mean, like, look, you, you're gonna have to represent us in one meet. So pick, you pick your bucks uh, across indoors, outdoors. Um, uh, and I think it's great to see. Like, I think it's a good university policy to have. Mm. Yeah, I mean, on the, ugh, you know, they are a strong uni, but for me, Birmingham win this team title hands down this weekend. Um, so, but but Leeds have a shout on the women's side. I, I really do think that um, Cambridge on the women's side, I think they have a shout as well um, at, at winning. That is, um, you know, and as well, Birmingham and Loughborough, obviously. Um, strong teams but uh but yeah that's bucks i'm, I'm gonna be up there so I'll try get some try get some content um as well Actually, oh, we looking, this well that's what i'm saying we better start wrapping up this podcast so i'm gonna get down to to Whiffy road and uh and put them through their paces final work well final big workout before bucks we're gonna go on share track, what's going down what are they fine-tuning i can share what's going down there's no there's no training secrets here just hard work just hard graft um yeah, they're gonna do they're gonna do three k, two k, one k, um, most. Uh, but a lot of them have Armada the week after, so kind of thinking ahead to to that five k as well. So, um, we'll try just get some like some hard five k reps. I mean, look, Nico Young, kind of you know Mike Smith getting Nico Young to that callousing workout. I think he called it just like five k pace for long sustained reps. Um. And they're ready for it. So let's, let's see how they rock and roll. I'm excited. I think we have an outside shot at a medal as well. So, um, But I won't put too much pressure on them. No, no. Good to hear, mate. Good to hear. Um, just on that then, before you shoot off the training, um, Armour obviously have announced partnership with Sports Shoes. Um, obviously, yes. we're, we're partnered with Sports Shoes as well. So we are slightly biased, but I think it's brilliant to see. And, and again, Sports Shoes just going out there and supporting the races that, that really matter to kind of your, your elite, your sub-elite athletes, um and I, I think it's brilliant like we kind of said look yeah go, go and support our race if you can um and and the sports shoes are obviously they're, they're ones who've gone and done it so uh so i think good job for everyone who kind of was crowdfunding and stuff but um but it's great to see mm -hmm. kind of that partnership start and hopefully that can continue to grow for for a few years as well 
Mm. I mean, I'm sure she's a partner with Parkrun as well. Yeah. Yeah. Which That's is, a breadth, you know, isn't they're, it? They're connected. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so but one, one thing, we'll, 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 yeah, we'll preview one more next week. Um, one more thing, New Balance Indoor Grand Prix. Um, that's next week. So there's some big names doing that as well. That you know, it's on Sunday as well. So make make sure we all we all tune in next Sunday. But uh, what Ellie Baker, Izzy Boffy are going to go in the 800, 3K. We've got a whole host of uh, people, you know, Brits in that 3K. Melissa Courtney, Izzy Fry, Anna Nutterwemi Pratt, Alex Millard. Strong, you know, female lineup in that 3K, and in the men's 3K, Neil Gawley and James West. Men's 1500. We're going to see Whiteman for the first time in about maybe 18 months on the track. Um, and then yeah. Tom Keane as well. I'm interested it's going to be a 15, I think. Yeah, What's I that? think interesting that he's opted. Interesting that he's opted for a 15 because obviously normally mm. he's a 3K, but I guess coming off the injury, maybe he doesn't feel so strong. So it be interesting because I think 15 is more like because the 3K, he could come out and run 750 and he'd sort of. As normal, be like, oh, well, well, three weeks will be fine. But I think in a 15, he can't come out and run 340, you know. Because, <laughs> He'll I just... win the race. I looked at the start list. Yeah. yeah. I looked at the start list. There's so, some names in there. I think if he wins the race, he'll he'll run, you know, 334. Someone like that. Mm -hmm. mm. So, uh, but hey, man. Be good, be good to That's see. It. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, well, thanks for listening. Um, hope you enjoyed this episode um, and we'll catch you very soon.